Season 1, Night in New Orleans, End of Night, Episode 1, The Tourist Trap. She came in alone, already drunk, swaying to the night rhythm, calling out over the band for beer and shots. An obvious tourist, wearing beads, an electric blue wig, and a giant plastic novelty cup. She surveyed the room, money in hand, stumbling past the nightly residence. She swayed, unheeding of her movement and gait. She was a sloppy drunk and had already attracted the wrong attention. The bartender took one look at her and glanced furtively towards the corner of the bar. A group of players and hangers-on, all sporting the same leather vest, playing pool and smiling. They went quiet at the girl's entrance. They're not looking at her, but each happens to change their stance ever so slightly. It's a subtle shift, and if you are not looking for it, the change would be easy to miss. The largest of the bikers holds the stick. He shoots and hands the stick to the biker next to him and walks to the bar. Bartender, three shots. One for me, myself, and I. She shouts and slams a 50 onto the counter. The biker smiles widely and approaches her. Mama's gonna get turned up tonight. I got those. I already paid. Then I get you another shot. (laughs) That's so nice of you. I think you will find I can be very nice. The bartender returns with the shots. You know, ma'am, if you go about two streets, there was a bunch more establishments you might find more exciting. This bar is generally for tourists. Now, Jules, you'll give us a bad reputation, says the biker, keeping his eyes on the girl. How about you come with me? Me and my friends can show you a side of New Orleans that you've never seen before. Well, that sounds like such a lovely offer. Aren't you a tasty treat? Who says chivalry's dead? She says, slurring her words. Now run along. I'll follow you by and by. The massive biker looked once at Jules, then smiled at the tourist. I'll see you soon. The biker walked back to the pool table. The slurring tourist lifted the shot. Well, mister? It's Jules. Will you cheers me? They raised their glasses. May our friends live forever and our enemies die in terror. They maintained eye contact clinked the glasses, then clinked them onto the bar. A traditional New Orleans toast involves two toasts, one for those drinking and one reserved for the dead, a bastardization of a traditional African libation ceremony. Jules took the shot, keeping his eyes on the large biker as he slowly walked away. He smiled, and through his teeth he spoke. Lady, you need to leave now. These guys are bad news. I can handle myself. I'm from Brooklyn. She threw back the shot. Lady, this ain't white, rich, hipster Brooklyn. This is New Orleans. You will be dead. Leave this bar now if you want to see the morning light. She smiled. The sway in her gait improved slightly, and her voice stopped its slur. Morning light. (laughs) If only. Thank you, Jules. You did not have to warn me. I will remember this night. Then she threw a $100 bill onto the bar and headed for the exit. Three steps towards the door, the large biker called out, Hey, where are you going? The night just started. She awkwardly waved. I'm not feeling so good, sugar. Some other time. She quickly stepped outside. The biker sent a poisonous look at Jules, gestured at his men, and headed for the door. Outside, the girl broke into a run, heading out away from the lights of the bars and the hotels and towards the docks and the water. If Jules had seen her, he would have warned her. Keep to the light. Find people and stay around them. There are predators out there in the night. Vicious, nasty things. They want you in the dark and alone. She was walking directly into their hunting grounds. The bikers left the bar single file altogether. Once out of the bar, they scanned the road. The girl glanced back, seized the men, then turned and took off into a run. Where are you going? Come on, girl, we just went to show you where the action is. We can show you the real New Orleans. The other bikers drunkenly laugh and cackle. The tourist twists and turns, moving faster than her drunken slurring and swaying would appear to allow for. The bikers jump on their motorcycles and give chase. They are on the trail and have the predator focus of the hunt. The clarity that comes with the scent of prey. The cool, calm, a millisecond before they strike. 
They move and practice silence as a unified force. The Taurus is breathing heavily now. She can hear the water nearby. The lights of the bar are far behind them, and the streetlights are few and far in between. Next to the water is a massive warehouse. On the side is a large, smiling crawfish. She trips on the gravel and hits the metal door loudly, making a large, percussive sound. The bikers hear her and close in. Their blood is hot and their breath heavy, salivating. They close in for the kill. The Taurus slips deeper into the shadows of the warehouse. Inside, it is pristine. The floor is covered by hard, cold metal. The warehouse is shaped like a large box with two levels separated by scaffolding and a large sliding door on the opposite wall that opens to the water. The bikers enter the warehouse spreading out. The leader steps forward and takes off his vest. He is covered in a collection of white supremacy tattoos, swastikas, iron crosses, and Nordic runes in haphazard iterations. Three interlocking triangles adorn his chest. The men snicker and sneer. They encircle the girl and close in around her like jackals would a wounded gazelle. The girl stops and turns. She stands straighter and tilts her head slightly. Her eyes are luminescent and yellow. The tattooed biker pauses. Let's lay our cards on the table, shall we? One of us is not leaving this room alive. The bikers laugh. <laughs> Just let it happen, girl. It'll be quicker for you if you do. I would give you the same deal, but I would be lying. She keeps backing up. The bikers follow, closing their semicircle. She reaches the far wall and presses a blue button on a large steel panel. The rusty doors that connect the factory to the street come down with a shutter. Just when I thought the night would be lonely. A voice in the shadows, high in the scaffolding above them. Out steps Warren. He is wearing a faded black t-shirt and jeans so old that the color is bleached out. In his hand, he is holding an obsidian knife that looks impossibly old. Blood for the gods. Warren sniffs once, deep. John, are you sure they are pure? The girl smiles. Her body contorts and face shifts. Harder cheekbones and strong chin. Her clothes change to flesh tone. She is now a man, strongly built, naked with strong hands and long fingers that end in sharp, talon-like nails. His face is smiling with long, sharp teeth. His eyes remain the same bright yellow. John points to the bare-chested, tattooed man in front of him. This one in particular, his blood sings to me. What in the fucking hell? Behind them, mocking laughter echoes off the steel walls. <laughs> a man walks forward with tight, curly hair cropped close on the sides and a stylish pompadour on top. You'll have to be more particular. There's so many hells. All are passed to the same place. After all, it's not the destination. This cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. But the journey that counts. Pooj takes one step forward. Cold air flows in his wake like an open door on a winter day. The bikers huddle together, feverishly pulling out knives and chains from their vests. I understand your confusion. You started the night thinking you were the apex predator. And now you're on a precipice about to fall from a great height. Down, down, down from your fantasy of what your life is to the grounded, jagged facts below. You are not the hunter. You are not even the prey. A prey makes choices. A prey has freedom. You're lambs for the slaughter. Nothing more than cattle. Pooj stretched out his hands and his heels lifted three inches off the ground. In his hands appear small curved blades. Not to worry. We are here to speed you on your path to enlightenment. John jumped forward, kicked the nearest biker, and stomped his chest, collapsing his rib cage like an accordion. Yes! Next stop on this enlightenment train is hell! And then the killing began. Warren jumped from the scaffolding in a high floating arc. He landed knife first, sinking his blade into the nearest biker's neck. Pooch smiles with a mouthful of razor sharp teeth, tilts his head, floating forward. The bikers panic and run into the center of the room. They scramble off each other like they are drowning and looking for any way to get air. 
Warren walks forward, his knife moving like it has a will of its own. He is chanting under his breath, prayers to his grandfather, offers of sacrifice, prayers to his mother, offers of hot blood spilled on the floor, spraying like a Pollock painting across the pristine white walls of the slaughterhouse. He moves like a dancer, as if the panic attack from the Doom Bikers is choreographed. He twirls in between them, darting in close to feel their dying breath, whispering like a Catholic confession. And then he takes their life like wind to a candle flame. John is a vicious beast, a tiger set loose in a henhouse. He has teeth and talon, hunger incarnate. He stops to feast on a struggling biker, holding him aloft with one hand, tearing out his throat with the other, then drinking by squeezing him like a Capri Sun. The biker struggles, beating on John with steadily weakening blows. The blood flow stops. John tosses the biker, roars, and rips into another. The large shirtless biker watches his friends die at John's hands, then turns and runs. He runs directly into Pooge. Pooge is higher off the ground now, floating a head taller than the tattooed biker. Pooge crosses his arms at his chest, then brings them out quickly and drops them to his sides. His movement is the model of efficiency. No motion is wasted. The curved knives flash and aortal blood jets into the air. The biker's head rolls across the floor. Pooch descends to the floor and looks around. All the bikers are dead. Warren is standing calm, red up to the elbows. John is naked and covered in blood. His mouth hangs open with a wide, lopsided smile. Well, that was just lovely. John walks over to the side of the warehouse to an emergency shower and turns it on. The blood flows off his hair and skin easily, and he is clean in a matter of moments. He walks languidly to a large ermine robe that is hanging next to the shower. You'd think they would know better by now. Are your mother and grandfather happy with their gifts? Warren closes his eyes for a moment listening. He took a small medallion out of his shirt. The medallion is dull yellow. Warren leaned close and whispered into the metal. The medallion lit brilliant green, and light engulfed the biker's dismembered corpses. In that light, the corpses shone bright, and a pale smoke drifted out of the bodies, funneled into a spiraling vortex to the center of the medallion. The vortex closes, and the medallion's glow changed from green to red. They are pleased with tonight. Good. Time to finish up. Pooj walked over to the side of the factory. You know, they used to clean fisheries such as these by hand back in the day. That was long ago. I keep forgetting how young you two are. I am over 200 years old. The conversation is smooth and well-worn as a pebble. Practically a baby. Are you still nursing, little guy? Pooch floated slowly to the scaffolding on the second floor. Warren leaped easily and landed silently next to Pooch. Pooch nodded to him and pressed a large red button out of a set of controls. The floor came alive. The door to the back of the factory facing the river opened up. Bodies are pushed to the side of the river and washed in. The blood on the floor followed. In the water, the river churned, and for a moment, something immense rises to the top of the water, a hint of black scales and yellow eyes before it descends again. The torn, dripping pieces of flesh fall into the river blackness and do not come back up again. Scene two, cruising. Three men driving down the secluded streets in New Orleans. They are in a vintage Cadillac Coupe de Ville. John is driving. Pooge is in the seat next to him, fiddling with his phone. Warren is in the back, looking out the window. The radio is on a fuzzy blue station that warbles in and out of reception. Warren sighs loudly from the back of the car. Pooch frowns and turns the fading radio station down. Are you sure? Yes. And your source? My source is good. It's a solid lead. It just doesn't feel right. John snickers from behind the wheel. (laughs) Admit it, you just don't want to be around all those people. Warren glares at John. John smiles back through the rear view mirror. Only his teeth show in the reflection. It is a lot of people packed together, sweating and pushing and yelling. (laughs) 
John laughed and Pooch smiled. You must exercise control. Oh, yeah, from Mr. I skull fuck my enemy's corpses. <laughs> Look, that was one time, it was a long time ago. I was tripping balls, and those fucking Vikings had it coming, okay? Sneaking up the rivers before dawn to rape and pillage my people. I don't fucking think so. Those motherfuckers had it coming. Jeez, someone's triggered. <laughs> I'm not the one you should be worried about. What? I'm a people person. <laughs> right before you eat them. I eat what I kill, dude. John shook his head and pursed his lips. What you two do? That's just wasteful. We all have obligations and debts to pay. John, in case you didn't catch it, that's Japanese for you are a bloodthirsty fucking animal. You say that as if it's a bad thing. We must not draw any attention. This club is central. We cannot have a killing here. Pooch looks at his companions, first at John, then at Warren. I need you to both act your most human. No killing. John looked at Warren, then both looked back at Pooch and burst out laughing at the same time. Pooch frowned. No killing. Shit, Pooch, killing is about as human as you can get. Here we go. Do you know the homicide rates from New Orleans last year? How many people died as a result of violence? That's not the point. Only a few years ago, public lynchings were an event. People used to pack a lunch and then take their kids to watch. Easy there. You're working yourself up into a lather. Before that was the Civil War, brother against brother, fighting over whether or not it was okay to keep people as property. At the same time, they were finishing off the genocide of the original people that lived here. A genocide that started with Warren's people. Damn right. Preach it. You are missing the point. And you are missing mine. Pooch sighed. Fine. If it will finish your rant, what is your point? My point is that killing is what people do. It is what they are best at. We just do it better. Don't fucking kill anybody at the concert. John smiled wide. Sure, no problem. Pooch looked at Warren. No killing. Scout's honor. I've been tracking these assholes for the past five years. We're close. Warren leaned towards Pooch. Do you really think it could be them? The Sipatateos? Pooch put up an open palm, weighing it. The white wizards are here. Their stench is on everything we touch. That biker tonight had them in his blood. I think there is a pure blood Sivatateo in the city. And if I'm right, we're going on a hunt. Scene 3. Special lady type friend. They parked away from the quarter and made their way towards Bourbon Street. As they approached, the crowd around them grew in size and volume. I don't like it. What's not to like? He was wearing sunglasses, despite the dark streets. Mmm, look at them all, free range. I thought you were a connoisseur. Ha, <laughs> look who's slumming it at the drive-thru. I have taste. It does not mean I don't eat fast food from time to time. Not tonight you don't. Keep your desires in check. John scowled. Now, that's the third time you cautioned me, you crusty old devil. If I didn't know any better, I might start thinking you didn't trust me. Pooch opened his arms, showing his hands, and looked deep into John's sunglasses. I trust you, John. Simple as that. The demon we are meeting tonight and I have history. She can be difficult. She? John snickered, then stopped. Did you say demon? Pooch grunted and kept walking. She is a messenger demon that deals in prophecy. They walked a block past a group of loud, drunk men singing in the streets. The closest man lumbered towards the trio. His barrel chest and massive stomach were barely held back by a black net tank top. He sported an enormous white Stetson hat on his head and a gold cross on his hairy chest. The man staggered over and put his hand on John and slurred. Hey man, give me a few bucks to keep the party going. Daddy needs some honey to make the engine purr. John reached out lightning quick and placed his fingernails on the man's hand. John flicked the skin between the fingers delicately, drawing blood. The man yelped and jumped back. He held his hand and looked at John with caution and outrage. John brought his finger to his lips and licked the blood off. He pulled his sunglasses down, revealing yellow, glowing eyes, and smiled a wide, toothy grin. Not tonight, friend. John whispered to the air. The man heard him and his back straightened as if he received an electric shock. But now I have your scent. Tomorrow, perhaps. The man backed away, mouth open, face drained of color. He staggered past his friends, pushed them away, and ran into the night. John looked back at Pooge and Warren, grinning with a million watt smile. Pooge glared back at him. What? I didn't kill him. Lighten up. The bar was close. 
but not on the main strip. It occupied the bottom of a two-story camelback shotgun. The night was hot and the windows were open. Blues music spilled out onto the street. The house band is pretty good. Eh, I've heard better. He walked to the door. A large bouncer at the door put his finger in Pooja's chest. No high yellow octoroons or creole bloodsuckers allowed. Pooja grabbed his finger and broke it in his fist. The bouncer screamed and fell to the ground, cradling his hand. John laughing. <laughs> the fuck happened to no killing? He'll live, and that's more than he deserves. Pooja glanced at Warren and John, then walked in. As John stepped over the wounded, screaming bouncer, he laughed. <laughs> you got off light, not like them Vikings. The bar was laid out into two larger rooms. The first room was dominated by a long wooden bar and circular tables, mostly occupied. The crowd was more subdued than the noise from outside. Here and there sat solitary patrons, nursing beers and listening to the music from the other room. John wrinkled his nose. This bar smells like death. Pooj passed the bar and walked into the second room. There was a blues trio on stage. In the center stood a singer. She had close set eyes, a wide smile, thin eyebrows, and impossibly high cheekbones. The band was sparse, like a tree in winter. They played without moving, staring straight ahead. Each note was correct, exact, and afforded no flourish. Pure soul, served up neat, no chaser. The spotlight shone on the singer, leaving the musicians wrapped in shadow. She was a flickering candle in the night. Her voice was sweet, wispy, honey, drizzled over coarse gravel. She swayed side to side and crooned her way through blues standards. Her voice pulled on the listener, inviting them to lean closer to catch the words. As the sound of the guitar's last note faded, the crowd stayed silent. Then... After a heartbeat, they clapped. The singer smiled and accepted praise. We will be back after a short break. Stick around and tip your bartender. Stay here. Pooj talked to the singer for a moment, then gestured to the table where Warren and John were sitting. Hey, what you think they're talking about? If I had to hazard a guess, I'd say they're reminiscent about all that nasty demon sex they had back in Ninja Soak Japan. That's bullshit. Now he's inviting her back for a big vampire gangbang orgy. John smiled. Yo, your mother was the goddess of sex, right? Teenage years must have been interesting. She is, not was, one of the lords of night. The goddess of lust, not sex. Sex, lust, same difference. Big difference, actually, like the difference between water and thirst. I did not know that part of her until I was almost an adult. Yeah? Who was she before that? Just my mother. No more, no less. Pooj and the singer approached the table. Up close, she was smaller. Her eyes darted back and forth between the two, watching them, then taking in the tables around them. Pooj had his hands at his side, empty, but free to move, not touching his pockets. Kitsune, these are my comrades, Warren and John, Warren and John, this is Kitsune. Kitsune nodded to each, then took a seat. He looked John up and down. So this is the company you are keeping these days. I would have expected better of you. Excuse me? Lady, you better watch your mouth. <laughs> Quiet, child. Your elders are talking. John's eyes narrowed. He began to rise. Warren put his hand on John's shoulder. John looked at Warren, then at Pooj. He rolled his eyes, sighing, and sat back down into his chair. The guitarist brought Kitsune a glass of wine. She took it without looking. He kept his eyes down and disappeared as quick as he came. So, how does a demon become a blue singer in a shithole like this? Kitsune took a sip and smiled with wine red lips. How did this son of a Nanahuat seen fall so far from grace to be visiting the likes of me in a shithole like this? She tilted her head to Pooj. That is why you are here, right? To find the Sivatadeo? To continue the work of the river dragon and taste the blood of the white wizards? We will find the Sivatadeo, then we will find those nasty little white wizards, and we will kill them all. Spoken like someone who has convinced himself that bloodlust and duty are the same. If you must talk about duty, then do yours, Yako, and give us the message from your master. 
Then you can go back to playing pretend with all these humans. Katsuni's eyes went hard, and her lip trembled a small shudder. She hid the expression behind her wine glass as best she could. When she spoke, the banter in her tone was gone. She replied in clipped sentences. We all do what we must to survive the millennia. You know that better than most. There is a prophecy concerning a comrade. She shook her head and gestured to Warren. The godling. The Siva Tateosia path to the end of night. That path lies through him. Okay, I'll bite. What is the end of night? Warren sat back and folded his arms. His mouth was a grim line. My people birthed this world from an eon of darkness. They ignited the sun and started the cycle of night and day. The end of night is the end of an age. Our age specifically. Godling, your age ended with Cortez and Columbus. Since then you and your kin have been living a borrowed time. The Siva today looks to collect on you. They are welcome to try. Careful what you wish for, Godling. Kinsune smiled and stood up. Where are you going? I have fulfilled my role, warrior. I have delivered my message. Now I'm going back to pretending to be human. Our conversation is not yet over. Katsune smirked, eyes darting back between Pooj, then Warren and John. Oh, but it is. Katsune's right ear flicked. On cue, each audience member stopped their conversation and turned towards the trio. The room was silent as a grave. The bouncer with his broken finger appeared, blocking the doorway with a riot baton in his good hand. You are in my place of power, warrior. You forget yourself. Pooch stood, holding up his hands in frustration. Fine, we will leave. No, I think it is too late for that. I have waited a long time for this day. Oh, have you? I don't remember earning your wrath. Did you think I was something to be used and discarded? Did I mean nothing to you? I knew it. What did I tell you, John? Dirty, feudal, Japanese sex times. We do what we must to pass the millennia, Kitsune. I did not mean to hurt you. Hurt me? I will show you the meaning of the word hurt. Kitsune flicked her ears, then turned to her guitarist. Make sure they leave here on their knees. Kitsune walked towards the kitchen. Warren pulled out his knife. No. If we kill a room full of mortals, it will focus the authorities on us. Fuck the cops. So what, we just let them hit us? We exercise restraint. The audience attacked like a wave crashing down on the trio. An old man wearing a black and gold saint's jersey dived over the table and clawed at Pooja's neck. Pooj rolled back, picked up his chair as he stood, and brought it down on the man's back. Pooj pulled and ripped off the leg of the chair, fashioning a makeshift club. Head for the door! Three teenagers tackled Warren. He shook off two of them, then push kicked the third in the stomach, knocking the wind out of her. She collapsed on the floor. An older woman, dressed in bright floral print, bellowed and swung a right cross at John. John ducked the punch, grabbed the woman's neck, and held her up in the air with one hand choking her. With the other, he swung his hand back. The nails on his hand lengthened and sharpened into a razor point. John hissed. As he swung his taloned hand, Pooj reached out and caught his hand. John, I trust you. John glared at Pooj, eyes wide. After a moment, he breathed deep, then dropped the woman to the floor. A young man wearing a black denim jacket dived at John, screaming. John sidestepped and slapped him in the back of the head with the flourish of a matador. Two more patrons attacked John from either side. Two pimp slaps to the face, dropping both. This bar sucks. Your crazy ex-girlfriend sucks. Around them, the room was littered with patrons, alive, but beaten and broken. She's not my fucking... The bouncer at the door cocks back the baton. Pooch stomps on his feet, takes the baton, and smashes the bouncer's good hand. Now you can't walk or jerk your tiny dick or wipe your shit kicker ass without pontificating on this one simple fact. Don't talk shit to strangers, you dirty little Nazi fuck. Also, miraculously, you are still looking better than those Vikings. 
Eat shit, you Nazi punk. Scene four, the street. The trio passed out of the pocket of bars and moved forward alone onto darkened streets. The street lights in this section of the quarter were mostly burned out or too far in between to provide constant illumination. People took the more well-lit routes, keeping in groups to maintain safety in numbers. Each local packs a weapon, from pepper spray to glocks. People that know this city keep their guard up at all times. You think this is bigger than Waco? And Waco was fucked. I didn't think we'd make it out of that one. Flashback to Warren running through rural Texas from 12 nuns with torches and pitchforks, clutching a bundle under his arm like a football. As he reaches the tree line at the end of a moonlit field, he turns and yells. Ha! I've still got your dinner, you filthy slags. He reaches a clearing in the forest and stops. Warren's senses, honed over centuries, will not be tricked. Come on out, hillbillies. I can smell the light beer and pork rinds from here. Three men step out from behind the trees. They are toting shotguns and Bud Light draping beer holsters from their hips. The nuns catch up and encircle Warren from behind. Their leader, a small man with a mullet and a white stratocaster slung over his shoulder, approaches. Give us the abomination, demon. Warren unwraps the bundle and snaps it out empty like a wet towel. Alakazam! Suck it, Mad Mardigan! Gasps and screams from the (gasps) nuns as they close in. Don't kill him. After all this, I want to keep this one in a constant state of pain for an indeterminate amount of time. Warren smiles and looks up at the trees. Yo, John, crush these inbred chodes. The ground starts shaking with John's laughter. The roots rise through the dirt as the branches dip down to meet them, creating a wooden prison cell around the group. Branches become spikes on the inside of the closing wooden spear like an Iron Maiden. Warren crawls out of a tiny hole of the spear. He runs to a hollowed-out tree and grabs out the bundle. The infant has green skin and yellow eyes. There's no better lullaby than the dying scream of your enemies. Isn't that right, little guy? The baby smiles. The night fills with screams and the sound of wood, bone, and flesh twisting and breaking. I think this is the biggest yet. The wizards we have found so far were crackerjacks and hermits. They had pockets of folks on the outskirts of urban sprawl. Your demon girlfriend... She is not my girlfriend. Look, sometimes you end up spending the better part of a decade in a parallel dimension, practicing tantric sex meditations with someone, and when it's all over, they act like they own you or some shit. It's fucking crazy. John and Warren exchange glances and smile. Sorry, your special ladylike demon friend just informed us that the wizards here are not in the shadows. They want to fuck us up. That's like looking for a molehill and finding a mountain. You think we can't handle them? No, I think it'll be fun. We just need to be smart about it. Pooch stopped and sniffed in deep. Speaking of fun, we are being followed. Same smell was in the bar. They passed a crosswalk and stepped into an alley between two buildings. Something's up. Warren, what do you have? Warren's gaze drifted up over the street, scanning back and forth. Three on the rooftop ahead. Warren squinted, then gestured to a collection of garbage cans across the road. There among the trash bags was the body. The enormous cowboy hat was pushed over his face, so if someone walked by quickly, you might think he was sleeping off a bender. Just another drunk tourist with alcohol poisoning to carefully step over in the French Quarter. The widening circle of blood pooling at his boots indicated otherwise. John, isn't that the human you were playing with earlier? That is just wrong. Fresh, old positive, right down the drain. John, the roof. John disappeared into the night. Pooge cracked his knuckles and rolled his shoulders. In the dark alley ahead of them, something cracked back. Warren and Pooge heard the creatures before they saw them. They moved off rhythm with herky-jerky joints that popped loudly. Their skin was stretched taunt as a guitar string that twanged and squealed like a yowling cat. Warren moved sideways out of the alley, putting space between him and Pooge. His obsidian blade was already in his hand, held low and out of sight. Pooge felt his lips pulled back, baring his teeth. A memory drifted up. No more than a collection of sensations. The smell of horse and cow dung. A small, empty village lying on the outskirts of a falling empire. A stolen spear in his calloused hands. It was that moment of tension, that knowledge of battle that was moments away and approaching. It was the deep rumble of an approaching avalanche or the receding waters heralding the typhoon. Battle was a force of nature, and And the hailstorm was upon them. 
first of the creatures stepped forward into the light of the flickering street lamp. Warren said something in Aztec that was sure to be a curse. English, please. There is no word for it in your impoverished modern language. I guess it translates to... Uh, shit, goddamn, kiss my grits, motherfucker, and oh my lucky stars, rolled into two syllables. The creatures walked on two legs, translucent skin stretched over creaking bones. Its face was little more than a skull with shimmering, taunt skin. The nose was eaten away, leaving the nasal passage open. Its eyes were deep set and glowing crimson in the darkness. It was dressed in an oversized overcoat and filthy pants. It stood for a moment and slowly lifted its bony hand and pointed at Pooj and Warren. The creature opened its mouth and chittered into the night. Two more creatures similarly dressed, with the same taunt skin and glowing eyes walked forward. Baycocks. I mean, zombies. They move faster than they look and they're tough to keep down. Stupid though, someone else has to be leading this party. It's a good thing we are both fast and tough, as well as breathtakingly pretty. Pooj called upon the river dragon. The smell of the Mississippi filled his nose. The feeling of deep, powerful eddies coursed in his ancient veins. He edged off the ground and floated upwards a few inches. Reaching into the darkness, he pulled out his twin curved kakori. The spirits inside the blade whispered to him in the dark, pleading and begging for release. Do these fuckers bleed? A little? They're mostly bones, ligaments, and skin. Then let's just do this for fun. Pooj floated forward, knives out. Most people overthink a fight. They think it's like a cartoon or some stupid Hollywood action movie. The truth is, most street fights are over in 30 seconds. They are bloody, awkward, and brutally visceral. Pooj arched forward and slashed at the closest attack. The Baycock reached with filthy hands and long, razor-sharp nails. Pooj bobbed and floated under the attack. Once the creature's hands were fully extended, Pooj hopped forward and swept up with his Kakori. He connected and slashed at the wrist, lopping off the creature's hand. The baycock pulled back its stump and slashed out with its uninjured hand without hesitation. Pooj went high and floated a few meters over the baycock's head. He hovered, taking aim, and then flipped upside down and slashed again. His blade connected and he felt the sweet rush of pleasure as the knife tasted blood. He slashed again at the injured baycock, aiming for the head. A second baycock lumbered towards him, forcing him back. Pooj snarled and stepped back. Warren waited for his baycock to get within striking range, then pounced. When Pooj fought, he was relentless, attacking from angles unseen and using strength and skill to win. Warren used speed. One moment he was there standing, waiting with his obsidian knife. In the next, Warren had already struck and was on to the next attack. He approached the baycocks like a butcher going to work. He dismembered two in moments. His quick, deadly moves, a mixture of Marine Corps martial arts and ancient Aztec fighting styles severing arms from shoulders and heads from necks. Soon, four creatures were in pieces at his feet. Let's get John and get the fuck out of here. Wait, I want to find out where these are coming from and have words with their master. These things don't stay down long. Pooj caught movement on the ground below. A severed arm shivered and drew closer to the torso, lying nearby. They reform. It's part of their charm. Let's get moving before they do. Above them was an explosion and a cry of pain. Two creatures, one in shabby overcoat and the other a prehistoric dire wolf, tangled together, falling from the roof, grappling as they fell. The wolf flipped the baycock and landed on him to push in his own landing. The dire wolf let out a bone chilling howl, then leaped towards them, panting. The form of the dire wolf contorted, stood up, and walked towards them on two legs. These guys taste terrible. Can we find something decent to eat? John spit a mixture of blood and viscera onto the cobblestones. Behind them, garbage cans toppled onto hard pavement. Slowly, the corpse pushed to stand up and lumbered towards the trio. The cowboy hat was covered in blood and still firmly on his head. His black tank top was torn in tatters, revealing a huge cut in his chest cavity where his heart had been ripped out and replaced with a blue stone. As he walked, the skin round the cavity wrapped and closed around the hole. His face was filthy. He was smiling. River Demon, you are far from home. Are you lost? Shall I aid in your return? Okay. Come show me the way, pretty boy. The creature roared and launched forward, only to be blindsided by Warren. Warren had waited till the creature was in motion before striking. Simple physics, Warren was outweighed, but he had speed and he had the perfect angle. The creature took the impact hard and landed against the brick building, breaking through. Warren rolled with the force of the tackle and sidestepped the hole. He stood, 
smacking brick dust from his hands and watched the hole. Nice hit. Think he's dead? Not likely. From inside the brick hole came a growling. The sound deepened into a basil roar. A shadow rose from the rubble. The outline of the shape moved and twisted like a living thing exploring the boundaries of creation. Its eyes glowed pale red in the center of a shifting mass. Its bones reformed and snapped into a new configuration, crunching and contorting. From its lips came a gurgling, strangled cry. Pitch and tone modulated as the tongue palate shifted and reformed. Behind them, the baycock chittered and shifted bones, starting to stand. Put those daisies in the dirt. I got the big guy. Pood snarled and called upon the river dragon. The sensation of deep black water filled him, lifted him from the ground. Pooj flew into the hole. The shifting shadow finished its transformation, settling on a massive simian form. Pooj caught a flash of dirty yellow fur, then made impact. He cut quick, aiming for arteries and tendons. The shapeshifter reached out and slapped him. Pooj fell back hard, reeling. The creature gave a rich, throaty laugh. You sound like a Bond villain. You sound like someone who's just realizing they are sinking in deep dark water, far from the shore. So you think brothers can't swim? Motherfucker, I swim like a shark! Pooch slashed at the creature, probing his defenses. He attacked the creature's eyes and slashed low, aiming for the arteries. The cut landed and he slashed the leg deep. A red line across the leg healed almost instantly. The creature laughed again. Fuck! It has been a minute since I've had a decent brawl. He circled the creature, arms out. Knives pointed towards the shapeshifter. He slashed again across his chest. Again he connected. Again the cut healed. Pooch jumped forward and stabbed deep, aiming for the creature's chest. The creature moved as Pooch leapt and embedded his knife into the slab of muscle between the shoulder and the neck. Pooj held on and pushed the knife deeper in. The creature laughed and backhanded Pooj. He lost his grip on the knife and fell back to the floor. Pooj scooted back, holding on to his remaining knife. The creature advanced, moving in for the kill. He did not bother to take the knife out, sticking in his shoulder. His mouth was slightly open, with drool dripping down. River demon, I will drag you back into the shadow realm where my spawn would feast on your bones. You know what your problem is? You talk too much. Behind the creature, the shadows flickered, and Warren swooped in with the accuracy of a diving raptor, burying his obsidian blade into the creature's back through the blue stone in its chest cavity. Black smoke rose from where the ancient blade struck. As the shapeshifter staggered, John attacked in direwolf form. He lunged, twisting his head so that his teeth perfectly wrapped around the creature's leg. As they attacked, Pooch jumped forward and slashed with his remaining knife. He cut low at the ankle, cut through, severing the foot. The creature roared and swung wildly at John, knocking him away. The shapeshifter lurched towards Warren. Warren fell back, his obsidian knife still inside the creature's chest. The creature pushed the stone knife further into its body, and the skin surrounded the knife, keeping it in place. The creature glared at Pooch, its eyes red with fury, then hobbled towards the hole back to the street. The creature shifted and stuttered as he dragged his injured leg away. The stub where his foot once was grew out to balance his weight better. As he reached the street, four stubs grew from its back. The stubs lengthened and segmented into longer legs like a spider. This is not over, River Demon. Before the end of days, I will know the taste of your blood. He has my knife. Grab him. The creature looked at Warren, smiled then leaped and climbed to the outer wall and skittered away. The trio rushed to the street. Outside, the body parts of the Baycocks were strewn all over, but they were no longer moving. Pooj looked up at the building. The creature was gone. John's body reformed back into human shape. That fucker took my knife. That knife was old. Don't worry, I got a connect for dope knives. No, I need that knife. It is my connection to my family. I need it to pay them the honor they are due. Anyway, what was that thing? I don't know, but I know where to find out. Pooj tilted his head. I smell bacon and I hear sirens. Let's bounce. It's May 1st, 1856, just outside of Kansas. It's a clear, cool night, eerily silent. Pooj is wearing a tattered shawl made from an old grain sack. He is chained to the wall. Blood is pooling at his feet. He crawls over to the wall and peers through a tiny hole. He sees three dark riders approaching with the horse-drawn wagon following slowly behind. Gunshots and screams fill the cool night air. Pooj hears the barn door swing open, the flicker of the lantern drawing near, the sounds of spurs slowly walking to the stall door. The 
The door swings open. Three large men enter the stall. The leader approaches Pooj with an unexpected sort of kindness in his eyes. My name is John, and these are my boys. We're going to get you out of these chains. The Brown family unchain Pooj. They hand him a clean folded shirt. When Pooj changes out of the burlap sack, they see his back, a dark crisscross of scars with fresh, still bleeding red lashes over top. Damn devils. They did the same shit to the son of the almighty. Come with us. They walk out of the barn to the wagon. Pooj sees his oppressors crucified on the burning farmhouse lawn. He is limping alongside them, breathing heavily. Thank you, and uh... I'm really sorry about this next part. Pooj's fangs are dripping now. He hasn't eaten in weeks. He swiftly moves behind John's son, kicks the back of his knees. He falls to the ground as Pooj sinks his teeth into his neck. John and his son reel back, gasping in terror. This most certainly is the devil's house. Back, demon! The Lord is my savior, and I shall fear no evil! As John Brown reaches for his gun, Pooj throws his son's limp, bloody body directly at him. John carefully catches the body and lays him down on the grass. He frantically pulls out a rag and tries to apply pressure to the gushing wound. Pooj vanishes into the shadows. His gaze is fixed on the injured boy as blood drips from his chin. John starts shaking and screams up into the sky. Is this what I get for believing in you? For dedicating my life to you? Is this what I deserve? Pooj appears with a red hot cattle branding iron in his right hand. He swings and cracks a home run on John Brown's head, knocking him unconscious. Shut the fuck up. Y'all preachers are such whiny little drama queens. Pooj shoves John's body to the side of his son, still bleeding and crying. He puts his foot on the boy's chest and cauterizes the wound with the branding iron. Quit your squirming, kid. Hold still. Another few seconds and the wound is sealed. Pooj stands over him as he passes out from the pain. You tell your papa he better take all that shit back. Tell him to keep doing the Lord's work of emancipation. Or else, I will come find the Browns and drag all you motherfuckers to hell. Long before I was born, there was no sun and no moon. The world existed in darkness. In that darkness lived monsters, creatures created from chaos and bound together by whispers of dark energy. They swam the shadows of the darkest void like a school of sharks in the ocean. In that darkness there were gods that strove to bring the light to the dark, order to chaos. They fought in secrecy and at great risk. The light was ready. All that was needed was a spark, a moment of true sacrifice to ignite the flames. For what is a greater sacrifice than that of immortal blood, to give up that life? One by one, each of the immortals approached the sacrificial circle and one by one, they looked away, cowering in fear, fear of the unknown. While the others refused the call, one stepped forward. He was the smallest of the gods, barely taller than a modern man. He looked into the eyes of oblivion and smiled. From, From my, my life's blood, blood to illuminate the path, path for us all, all, he said. He drew a blade and stabbed it into his own heart. As he fell to his knees, his heart's blood flowed like a river into the fledgling sun. At the touch of his divine ichor, the sun ignited and grew into a flame. The fire spread and the god was consumed in the inferno. As the fire burned his body to ashes, the fire stayed, condensed, and took the form of so recently consumed. In this way, my grandfather gave his life to the rest of the world. On the day of my manhood rites, I received the obsidian knife that was stained with divine heart's blood. Each time I take the life of an enemy, my grandfather's sacrifice is honored. Warren looks at the brand new knife in his hand. He looks to the vendor across the table, then back at John. Which is why I cannot just take a discount Bowie knife from your friend in the French market. Warren set the knife back on the table and walks away from the vendor. John picks up the knife and flips it in his hand. Well, when you put it that way, I feel like an asshole. I was just trying to help. John pulled money from his pocket and hands it to the vendor. He flipped the knife again and stashes it into his ermine coat. You're fucking lost. It's a perfectly good knife. Around them, the night market is in full swing. Tables hastily set with wares. Some illicit, some immoral, and all downright weird. The market lives by two rules. Let the buyer beware and all sales are final. Morin finds Pooj arguing with a pale, slim woman in an enormous brown robe with a large, hunched back. She is sitting behind a plywood table covered with a red tablecloth. The table is littered with vials with liquids of various colors and textures. Pooj is holding a vial with green liquid and is looming. I don't care what the fucking lizard said. If this is dragon's blood, then I have an NFT to sell you 
of my dick. Pooj sees John and waves him over. John, come here, smell this. Pooj waves the vial under John's nose. Spider silk mixed with tiger blood and bull semen. Do I look like a tourist to you? See any beads? Am I drinking from a giant plastic neon cup? Pooj puts the cap on the vial and drops it on the table. I am but a poor woman selling my wares. You are a liar and a cheat. You should be ashamed of yourself. I asked you for dragon's blood and you gave me bull semen. I would be more concerned with the spider silk. There are eggs in there. She was looking to get you pregnant. Are you sneaky? Pooj reached across the table and pulled the woman closer. She ducked as he leaned forward, dropping the cloak and scuttling away. Her back is swollen and translucent. As she runs, her back sloshes back and forth. Inside, shadows swim to and fro just underneath the surface. He lunges forward to jump over the table and give chase, but Warren puts a hand on his shoulder. Leave her. You have business to attend to. Next time I see you, you're going to swallow a whole can of Raid. Then I'm going to find a giant scorpion and gobble up your little nasties. Around them, the commotion goes unnoticed. The night market is used to particularities among vendors. The trio continue to the center of the market. In the dim warehouse light, the center is easy to make out. A large black door adorned with a single red rose alone and without support. A large man in red suspenders stands on the rose side of the door. Do you have an appointment? Warren steps forward and produces his golden amulet. I'm family. The guard steps to the side, nods his head. Warren stands in front of the door, holding his amulet high. He is talking low in Aztec. The amulet hums and glows with golden light. I thought we were going to a bar. What the fuck is this voodoo shit? This is not voodoo shit. This is Aztec mumbo jumbo. Warren, you have exactly three seconds before I kick that fucking door down. One... Two. The door clicks open. The sound of a deep bass pulse and flickering lights sneak out of the cracked doorway. Let's go see the flower prints. Warren leads them into the nightclub. The door opens to a large room packed with dancers. The flickering lights give flashes of an array of costumes ranging from typical black leather club garb to more exotic and risque costumes. All right, now this is what I was talking about. Each floor has a different theme with a different password. My uncle should be at the highest floor. Come on, stares it this way. While Warren was speaking, John caught the eye of a dancer. He is now pressed up on the wall, kissing her neck, hands reaching to unbuckle his pants. John, work first, then playtime. Give me a minute. I have work of my own here to finish up. Leave him. There's an enchantment on this place. Once you consent to partake, you need to give something back. I am not going to stand here waiting for John to finish up. Ah! Ah. Don't worry. The goal of the enchantment is to ratchet up excitement to the breaking point. Sounds like John is about to give his gift. Ah. Even over the cacophony of the booming bass and music, the sound of John's exertions are clearly heard. Ah. The dancers circle around him, cheering him on. John has shirked off his ermine robe and is naked and covered in a sheen of sweat that glows multicolored in the strobing lights. His partner's clothes are strewn around them. John has her pinned against the wall, legs wrapped around him, eyes locked together, breathing in unison. As he comes close to his climax, the dancer tightens her legs and pulls him in. Her eyes flash yellow on rhythm with each thrust. The sheen around his body is a fluorescent green glow that is brightening and building. Why does John look like a lightning bug? Suction. His sexual energy is being cultivated. Watch this. As he comes close to his climax, the dancer tightens her legs and pulls him in. Her eyes flash yellow on rhythm with each thrust. The sheen around his body is a fluorescent green glow that is brightening and building. John's body moves with a flurry of purpose. His rhythm increases in tempo and intensity. The glow around his body brightens, flashes green, when the flash fades, John is lying naked on his ermine coat, breathing deeply. His partner leans down and kisses him gently on the forehead, then moves to pick up her clothes. John smiles and rests his head. This bar fucking rules. Warren, your family is awesome. I want to come over for Thanksgiving. Warren smiles, reaches down, and gives John a hand. John takes it and stands up. Man, I feel like I just ran a marathon. Essentially, you just did. You just gave a little piece of your soul away. My soul? Don't worry, it will grow back. The dancer wipes the sweat up John's forehead and licks it off her fingers, smiling brightly. She whispers in his ear. The trio left the dance floor and climbed to the next level. The stairway spirals as it ascends above. There are no basements here. It's a swamp city. 
The stairs change from industrial standard to soft red carpets. At the bottom of the stairs, the floor opens up into a grand hallway. One floor to go. Stay on the path. Don't stray off. This floor is not as innocent as the one below. The hallway rises high, higher than should be possible in the staircase. The ceiling is lined with arches painted in gold and white. Rooms line the hallway. Most of the doors are closed. The sounds of people crying out loudly come from behind them. Some of the sounds are that of pleasure, others that of pain and fear. They pass an open door. Inside, a man is attached to the wall with knives in his wrist. Blood is flowing freely from his wounds. He has long, unkept hair drooping over his naked body. He is painfully aroused. Next to him is a person clad in full leather with a Minnie Mouse mask covering his head. He is holding a riding crop and a razor. The man looks up and stares at the visitors. He holds out the riding crop, offering it to John. Help me! Baby, Baby be good! Baby, Baby wanna play! Keep it moving, gents. We are almost there. The hallway stretches and winds in a small circle. Is this it? I'm getting nervous. Every labyrinth has a minotaur. They hear a loud howling as they pass the next open door. Inside, they see an enormous werewolf chained to the table, head in vice grips and her legs spread wide. There are two men in shorts suckling the milk from her swollen teats, <laughs> drinking and laughing as the werewolf moans and growls. The veins in their backs begin to bulge and sprout hair. The cries of her starving pups echo from the back of the room. Oh shit! Blood moon! Come on, this is it. The staircase ended at a white door. Pooj, Warren, and John walked in. The room was sparse. It had dirty white walls and small, D-shaped holes reminiscent of a bee's nursery. In the center of the room was a large man sitting on a throne. He is petting a strange beast that sat at his side. Above the neck, the creature's head was a dog skeleton with glowing red eyes. The man sitting on the throne is bone thin. His sparse hair was slicked back and his eyes were two different colors, one blue and the other black. At their entrance, the man looked up at the trio. He stopped petting his dog. Uncle, I have come for a visit and I have brought friends. Warren gestured to his companions. News of your exploits have reached me even here. This is the realm of the dead. Only the most important news from the realm of the living can reach these hallowed halls. Important news is what we seek. Warren has told us of your formidable knowledge. We seek the Siva Tateo that are here in New Orleans. Warren says you know things. Things that can help us out. Did Warren say that? What else did he say? He said that you were family and that you value your blood ties. There is only one thing more important than family, and that is honor. Do you know what the name Sivateteo means in our language? No, but I get the impression you're going to tell me. It means honored mother. In centuries past, the Sivateteo served my family. They were selected from the souls of women who died in childbirth to be reborn as guardians of our people. They were given great and terrible powers to wield against our enemies. Let me guess. All that power and now they use it against you. Such power cannot be used directly against my family. It is our power freely given. However, once given, it cannot be taken back. So let me get this right. The Siva Tateos, they infest an area, infect the populace like a swarming cancer. That is your family's legacy? Careful, warrior. Do not forget where you stand. The Siva Tateos were soldiers in the war between the gods. You of all people should understand that there are means that justify the ends. I have heard tales of you, warrior. Your shadow is caked in blood. I am not here to pass judgment. I'm here to exterminate. Now, are you just going to sit there on your sex death throne with your dick in your hand, or are you going to step up? The flower prince smiles with overly large teeth. Oh, the stories they say about you are true. Yes, I could help you. I need something from you first. Name it. This little escapade of yours will have consequences. I want to ensure that these consequences fall on someone else. For that, I require a focus. Brother, may I ask what do you need? Give us a straight answer. What is it that you think we do here? From the looks of it, throw sick parties on the ground floor and get twisted up and down. We collect energy. Sex energy. Death energy. The energy of belief and worship. We take this and we store it. 
The flower prince gestures to the large throne room. That is why I can exist so near to the mortal realm and thrive, while other members of my family subsist on the meager sacrifices of their few remaining devotees. We are wasting moonlight. Tell us what you need so we can get it and get out of here. The flower prince smiled and held out his hand. A red rose petal floated onto the center of his palm. A glowing orb formed over the petal. It grew in size and flickered. A form took hold inside the spear. That is a raccoon. Why do you want a raccoon? That's not a raccoon. It's a tanuki. And uh, what is a tanuki? Picture a raccoon dog, but Japanese and drunk. Also, they have... The image panned out displaying the tanuki fully. It stood on two legs with a bottle of sake in one hand. Its other hand was between its legs and working furiously. Wow, is that his... The tanuki looked at first to be sitting side saddle on a large furry mound. The mound moved back and forth and the tanuki would bounce back, hopping up and down. Yes, that would be his huge testicles. Bring me one back here, alive and I will aid you in your quest to kill the Sipatiteo. Back in an hour. I know a guy. Scene 7. Free Tanuki. They sit in front of a shabby shotgun. Pooj turns off the engine. This is a witch's lair. Awesome! I love witches! Not the good kind. I thought all witches were good and that a bad witch was just misogynist rhetoric. Mostly true. Witches were all servants of Mother Nature at one point. The Salem trials pushed a few too far. Through prayer and mantra, they summoned Kali, the goddess of death. She gifted them with the means to exact vengeance on the men that tortured and murdered their sisters and daughters, transforming the brooms they used to sweep and the knives they used to cook into mystical weapons. After the bloodbath, the few witches left returned to the forest, hiding in caves and shacks, luring in the sons of men with sweet candies and cakes. This is one of those witches. Does she eat babies? No. That was a rumor started by the Catholic Church. These witches really hate Christians. The witches found a few of the church's pray the gay away camps. These fucked up remote camps where they try and brainwash kids into being straight. It's totally fucked. So anyhow, the witches found them, freed the children, and burned the camps to the ground. So the Catholic Church said the witches, quote, stole their children for food and sacrifice. They really just got them to safety. Uh, the white man's history is written in lies and drenched in blood. Especially when they lose. Anyhow, this is not a normal good witch. She's a nasty bad one. Let's snake around back. In the back of the house was a large wooden fence. They peered in the holes. What the fuck are those? Five enormous beasts roamed free in the kennel. Two had wolf heads and pig legs. Two had rat heads and dog bodies. One had a unicorn's head and a rat's body. They growled and paced in a circle surrounding the Tanuki. Mm, looks like she's been crossbreeding. Nutria, boar, unicorn, and Tanuki. Mm, man, they're ugly. A tall, slender man dressed like a barber with a handlebar mustache opens the back door to the kennel and makes kissy noises Come at the beasts. On. Come on. He takes out a bucket full of human hey, ears hey, and tosses on, them in the air. The beasts howl with excitement and jump in the air to catch the treats. That's her son. John, we need a distraction. Quick, ring the doorbell. John moves as a blur of flashing light to the front door. He transforms into a nine-year-old boy with a basketball under his arm. The witch's son hears the doorbell, throws a few more ears to the ground, then rushes to the front door. You know what time it is? What do you want? I can't find my mommy. Can I call her on your phone? Sure. Come on in. You like candy? Warren and Pooj are closing in on the Tanuki. Aren't raccoons in the bear family? The corner Tanuki roars and swipes at Pooj with its claws. Pooj ducks and uppercuts the Tanuki. As its head pops back, Warren wraps chains around its snout like a muzzle. Pooj wraps its legs. They drag the chained beast to the car and throw it into the trunk. Where's John? The house lights up with screams and the sound of struggle. The chimney bursts flames five feet into the air. I feel like we should check on John. A large bat shoots out flames from the chimney. The bat soars into the front seat. Then it transforms back to John. Nasty old witch! Let's go. We got what we came for. What happened to the other creatures? 
We transported them to the Everglades. Figured they could run free and feed on the Trump supporters and retirees. <laughs> awesome. Two days later in Florida, it's a beautiful sunny day. Six friends are tubing down the river. MAGA hats and Dixie bathing suits with two 12 packs of light beer hooked to the tube. Is that a stick? It's coming right at us. No, nah, man, it's just a... The head of a unicorn comes out of the water. It's a miracle! The unicorn's mouth opens to reveal a tongue lined with sharp teeth like a goose. Its giant rodent claws grab the tube as it spears the tuber's head with its tongue. The other tubers scream and paddle for the shore. When they get to the shore, they watch as the unicorn rat and their friend thrash about in the water. Sonny! No! What in God's name? As they watch their friend die, behind the tubers, two beasts with wolf heads and pig bodies close in for the kill. <laughs> Scene 8, Into the Blue Door. Standing in front of the flower prince with the tanuki trussed and bound, its enormous testicles growing and shrinking like a bubble from a child's toy, moving its body from side to side. Well, you certainly delivered. I imagined you would have some more difficulty. Tanukis are known for their vicious demeanor. Nothing we couldn't handle. Now if you would, we have questions that need answers. And answers you shall have. The Flower Prince gestures and the shadows come alive. Three of the shadows converge on the Tanuki and drag it from the room. The Tanuki whines from behind its bound mouth. Good luck, little guy. The Flower Prince walks to one side of the throne room. He stands beside a section of wall that has been draped over by a large crimson cloth. On one side he pulls a golden cord and the crimson cloth parts to reveal a blue door. Surrounding the door is a green flame that does not burn. Behind this door are the answers that you seek. Take care of the questions you ask. You will each get one question and one answer. After you receive your answer, return through the blue door. I will await your return. That's it? Would you prefer fearsome hell beasts? If I look, I'm sure I can find some. Whatever. Let's do this. They open the blue door and step through. The door shuts behind them. They step forward until they reach the center of the room. A golden cage sits in the far corner. Inside it are small fairies about the size of hummingbirds, flying wildly in circles. A man with green skin and orange monk robes opens the cage and plucks a screaming fairy with delicate care. His long on, nails guy? pluck the wings from the fairy and places them in a bowl of a large hookah hey, pipe hey, hey, on the floor. Wings. He pops the wingless body into his mouth, chews and swallows with a smile, then places a hot coal on the wings and takes a large hit of the hookah. He coughs as he lets out a blue cloud in a circle at the ceiling. Then he drops the hose and lets out a low growl like a Gregorian monk chant. In the middle of the vast room are three mirrors. Each mirror is identical in full length. The trio look at each other for a moment, then step forward to look in the mirrors. Either of you see anything? Nothing. I can't see shit in this blue fog. Warren, I am beginning to think that your uncle may have... Wait, I see something. What do you see? It's me. What the hell is this? In front of John stood a reflection of himself. It was John from another time, before he found his gift. This John was dressed in rags and half-starved. He was covered in blood. Only some of it was his. This John was alone and scared. This John was human. He stepped through the mirror, leaving ripples in his wake. Ask me your question. Who are you? I am you, the part of you that remains human. As much as you delve into the primacy of the beast, as many times as you shapeshift and contort your appearance, know this, at your core, at the base of your soul, you are still human. That is your fortune cookie wisdom for me, that I am human, that I'm still weak? That is your frailty. That is also your strength. John's image faded into the blue smoke. Man, it's some bullshit. I see something. Uh, looks like I'm up. Warren's mirror reflected a figure that approached until it stood and faced Warren through the glass. This was Warren, but older, battle-scarred and haunted eyes. His clothes were soiled with mud and blood. No, that is not your question. Don't ask me that. It's funny. I remember this conversation now. I remember thinking, I look so old. It was not so long ago. You are me, aren't you? Again, that is the wrong question. This is a turning point for us. You seek the Sifa Tateo. Though you each have a different reason for wanting them, you are all still united in this purpose, yes? Where are the Siva Tateo? That is the right question. You have guessed correctly. They are not hiding in the shadows, they are hiding in plain sight. 
the mayor of New Orleans is the son of the Sevatateo you seek. She is with him at the mayoral mansion. Each night he comes to her to suckle at her teat and find comfort. Each day he wipes the dreck and grim from his naked body, puts on a suit and tie, and leads the city closer to the brink of damnation. What do you mean damnation? What are they after? The reflection of Warren from the future looks to speak, then starts to fade into smoke. I have to follow the rules of this place. You have asked your question, and now I must return. One word of warning before I go. Beware of our uncle. He is not what he seems. Warren's reflection faded into the blue smoke. See that? Now that is how a mystic reflection in a shadow realm should act. Actual answer and none of this find your true nature bullshit. Pooj, have you seen anything in your mirror yet? Nothing. I think mine's broken. It's enough. We have the answers we need. Let's go to the mayor's mansion and burn that fucker down. What do you think my reflection meant about my uncle? I don't know, but plan on asking. Wait, wait, wait. I see something. The shadow in Pooja's mirror condenses into an enormous form. What is that? It's big. So big that it covers the reflection. It is about time we had a conversation. You! We should have some privacy. Your friends can wait for you on the other side. The shadow and the reflection moves in a sweeping motion. The blue door opens and John and Warren are swept out through the door. I appreciated the gifts. Fuck you. I have been here for 300 years and this is the second time we're having a conversation? There was nothing to talk about. You were given to my care to work off a debt. That debt has been paid and you are free to return to Japan. I can go home? Just like that? As I told you when we first spoke, you were to find humility to temper your passion and rage. The most powerful tree needs roots to hold it to the earth, else it will fall with the wind. And you have done so. You have guided your friends to find their better natures, and in turn your own. Well done. Time to go back to your own river and all that is waiting for you there. In the reflection, there is movement again, and the blue door opens. A force pushes Pooj towards the door. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. What about my friends? The force pushing Pooj towards the door ebbs. They are now on a path that diverges from yours. No. This is what you want, is it not? I can see into your soul and see your heart's desire. This is it. No, not yet. I'm not done here yet. If my debt to you is fulfilled, I may come and go as I please. And right now my friends need me with them in New Orleans. So be it, warrior. Be cautious this time. You may find yourself outliving your friends again. The blue mist clears from the room and Pooj is left alone, looking into the mirror of his own reflection. He carefully runs his hand through his hair. He pulls his short sword from its sheath, looks down at the reflection of his fangs in the sword as he reads the engraving. My power, my deliverance, my peace etched into the blade. He kneels down and removes his leather loafers, socks, watch, and rings. He closed the blue door behind him and ran into the shadows. Scene 9, The White Circle. John and Warren go back through the blue door. What the fuck was that? I don't know, something from Pooja's mirror. That was powerful magic. John heads for the blue door to re-enter. Wait, John, the mirror showed us something personal. Whatever was in Pooja's mirror, it was for him to overcome. He'll catch up. Right now, we know our enemy and need to prepare. Welcome back. I hope you found what you were looking for. We did indeed. The mayor. The mayor is hosting the whole nest. Time to exterminate. Oh, indeed. Well, then we should access options. Yes, we should prepare to burn down his mansion. And what would that do? That would create chaos. Throw the city into disarray. Military action. The Sifatateo are a plague. We will cut out the sickness. That has always been your weakness, Warren. You see the world in black and white. Keeping up the sacrifices to your mother in their time of need. Fighting the good fight and vanquishing enemies. The flower prince stood and descended from the throne of bones. There are sounds of violence and shouts coming from outside the throne room. The flower prince walked to the door. Are you being attacked? Me? No. From a certain level, one can see that the world is not black and white. It is multifaceted shades of gray. 
Each decision has cost and a benefit. Each struggle has a sacrifice. Did you ever think that your mother and father do not need your meager offerings? What they need more is a change in the status quo. Outside, the commotion and violence gets louder. The skull dog looks up, then at the flower prince and settles its head back down. Something going on outside we should know about? What do you know about the world outside? Your baby's playing with firearms. I was born a god. I have seen the beginning of the world and have watched as my family has been all but forgotten. There are some that are content to let their light grow dim as the next generation rises to ascension. Such weakness has never been in my nature. One has to change with the times. You can't go from such great heights to being forgotten. What did you do, uncle? I don't have to explain myself to a whelp like you, and I will not have your escapades ruin what I built here. Warren steps back, shocked. Around the walls of the throne rooms are catacomb tombs, the sound of bones scraping against stone. From out of the catacombs crawl out skeletons, brandishing swords. Oh, that is some cold shit. The flower prince gestures, the door swings open. Six men in white robes and masks walk in holding wooden staffs. Behind them, the corpse of a large cowboy pushes forward. His eyes glow yellow and his nails are extended into large, long claws. You brought this upon yourself. Well, the flower prince and his dog disappear in a cloak of shadow. John and Warren are left with the skeletons, the wizards, and the skinwalker. The cat and mother wants them alive, but she did not specify whole. The skinwalker smiled, skin cracking on each side of his face. Old blood and pus oozed out of the cracks at the corners of his smile. Break as many bones as you like. Playtime, motherfucker. John pulls out a large knife. Hey, where did you get that? This, I bought it at the market. Do you like it? Warren goes for the skinwalker, walking through a bunch of skeletons with swords. He has no knife, but pulls a sword from a skeleton, uses it twice, and it breaks. Shit. Oh, did your sword break? Is that because it's old? That's too bad. John swipes through a bunch of skeletons, slashing through bone. The knife gets embedded in the skull of one of the skeletons. Oh, did you lose your new knife? That's a shame. That's why I brought more. John pulls out two knives from his ermine coat and tosses one to Warren. Warren catches it and gives John a fencer's nod. Let's dance. John leaps through the air and slashes at the closest skeleton. His aim is true and he severs the vertebrae at the base of the skull. The head rolls forward and the skeleton falls to pieces. He parries left, knife first cutting through two more of the ghastly soldiers. Warren's moves are a blur, darting to and fro, skeletons going down like chattel. In the background, the wizards stick to the walls of the side of the room and spread out. That all you got? Fuck these skeletons, let's get the big ugly. Promises, promises. Come and meet your betters. John and Warren take out the closest skeletons and converge on the skinwalker. Its skin turns yellow and bursts with muscle, contorting into a bear shape. Its jaws break open into a distorted crocodile mouth. It roars, but is cut off midway by Warren stabbing it through the mouth, the knife going between the bottom and the top of his face. John, I need a new knife. Here, take this. John tosses his knife. Warren catches it. I have a few of my own. John's nails lengthen and thicken on his right hand until they're claws. The rest of his body contorts, grows hair, and swells with muscle. He opens his saber-toothed mouth and roars. Warren attacks the skinwalker. He darts in, taking quick stabs, then retreating before the skinwalker can mount a good defense. While Warren is occupying the skinwalker, John in feline form jumps in and latches onto the creature's knee. He crunches down hard and cracks the bone in his massive jaws. Tastes like shit. Rotten, dirty shit. From each side of the room, the white wizards chant and raise their stabs. They set their stabs to the ground to ignite in a small white flame. The flames alight and create a circle surrounding John, Warren, and the skinwalker. Wait, wizards, let me out of the circle. John, this is no bueno. We need to get those wizards now. On it. John turns and leaps for the closest wizard, but it's too late. The fiery circle completes and seals. Inside the circle flashes a blinding white light. Three days later, the building that housed the club is abandoned. The throne room is cleared and covered in dust. Cobwebs cover a faded blue door. From behind the door is a rhythmic thud. Then the door opens, releasing a cloud of dust. Pooj, barefoot and brandishing his short sword, walks through the door, ready for the fight. He takes in the room, the emptiness in his surroundings. What the fuck? Next time on Fables and Legends of the River Dragon. 
Pooj and Warren ride jet skis holding harpoons. John's dorsal fin cruising alongside. He has taken the form of a great white shark. The water erupts in their path. Tentacles shoot towards them from below. What the fuck is that? A giant squid? It's the sea beast. I've seen those tentacles before. Attack the eyes! We're gonna need some bigger harpoons. Good thing I brought the grenades. The mother and child huddle together for warmth on the edge of a rooftop. It's night after a hurricane. The water has risen to cover all but the rooftops. Rotting hands reach from the water to pull themselves onto the roof. Zombies that floated down from the power plant explosion. Five decrepit corpses crawl towards them screaming, Fresh meat. Warren jumps from the water, blade in hand, and stomps his boot down hard on the zombie's skull, smashing it open. Maggots and flies pour out of the rotting skull onto the shingles. Fucking zombies! So gross! I know. Can't live with them, and you definitely can't eat them. He and Warren pull their knives and decapitate the remaining zombies. The mother and child are relieved. You saved us! Praise Jesus! Praise the Lord! Pooch turns to Warren. Why do they always thank Jesus? He was a rad dude with a drinking problem and a love of prostitutes. Did Jesus just decapitate these maggot-filled nasties? No, it was us. The demons, the vampires, the monsters. You ain't trying to praise us. John, get him out of here. John has taken the form of a mastodon, half submerged, dragging a Viking ship in tow. A Viking ship? Oh, fuck you. <laughs> this is not in my skull, please. The mother and child board the ship, dumbfounded. John and Warren are in an arena, surrounded by a circle of salt. Both are bloodied and beaten. Around them are a collection of clan wizards. The wizards are chanting and holding hands, making arcane, sometimes rude gestures. An unearthly green light is glowing off the salt. You crackle bitches don't know when to quit. Yeah, well, see if you can chant when your mouth is full of spider sperm. Warren throws a vial at the nearest clan wizard, hits him in the mask with a green liquid. Can't handle that? Don't worry, the babies know how to dig deep to get where the warmth is. The sound of small creatures crawling all over the wizard. The wizard screams loudly at first, then his cries modulate and morph into a liquidy strangle. The wizard's body bulges and explodes with baby spiders growing as they fly through the air. The baby spiders hit the wizards and crawl all over them, aiming for orifices. It's a hillbilly buffet. All you can eat. Warren and John tied up on an altar. The mayor is wearing a red robe with a fur cape. Next to him is a thin-faced woman with alabaster skin. Her face is smooth and looks young with the exception of her eyes. They are ancient. Her hands are also old and veiny. I pledge these souls to the gods of old, the gods of darkness and chaos. May their reign end the tyranny of time and bring the end of day, the end of night. May the world shudder and rip asunder to be created anew in the likeness of its new masters. May the ever ravenous deep gorging beast that exists at the well of the abyss swallow your souls. The door is broken down. There stands Pooj. His clothes are ripped and his body is bloodied. In one hand, he is dragging the shapeshifter by the hair. In the other, he is holding a short samurai sword. Pooj points the sword towards the mayor and his mama. Fuck you, Doodlemore. Everyone here is about to watch you die. Pooj, Warren, and John are standing on a building watching the sky redden and a huge wave heading for New Orleans. That is a big fucking wave. The old ones have risen and are returning to this reality. That sounds bad. According to the stories of my family, they bring back the dead on ships created from human nails. Those that have died will rise and become their zombie army to battle the righteous for the world. Yep, definitely bad. So we are the righteous now. Looks like. The red wave is cresting. At the top of the plume, a gigantic Viking ship emerges from the water. It is shining in an earthy green glow, like midnight algae. Its hull is smooth and white and cuts through the water like a sharpened razor. Its deck is crowded with a motley collection of figures, all armored, all screaming in various degrees of decomposition. Did you say that ship is made from nails? Like fingernails? Why? Trees don't grow in hell. Everything there is made from carcasses. Do fingernails burn? Pooch picks up an RPG rocket launcher. It looks straight out of an 80s action movie. Let's find out. 
fucking Viking motherfuckers. Welcome to the future.